In this task we're going to look at an adaptive notch filter. Here is Speedster splash panel. We have various standard demos which is a very good place to start when you're trying to learn your well, what's in uh, DSP Speedster and find your way around. If we click to this this model right down here at the bottom we can go through one of these demos. I'll get rid of the general background here. I'll get rid of the splash panel and try to focus us just on these, this model. We see here a sine wave which can be tuned in terms of its frequency. At the moment it's 446 hertz. Uh, we see an adaptive notch filter which looks quite innocent here. We, do, we needn't look inside and find out what's in there unless we should want to. Uh, we're going to be able to look at the output of that notch filter and contrast that on this dual tray scope to what comes in directly from the sine wave generator. The objective is to have this notch filter kill the sine wave by recognizing it and uh, tuning itself appropriately. Let's look inside one level anyway, do a right click on this model look under mask and I can begin to see the complexity that's hidden in there. I see that this is actually a second order section. These are, here's the uh, central uh, backbone of the delays and the multipliers. So this is actually a very cheap filter. It's going to just have uh, two poles and two zeros. And uh, out comes the, uh, the various uh, information about the, the um, coefficients which we'll be able to track on the CPIG analyzer. If we should want to know how this is doing its magic, we could push inside this block because in, in Speedster we have, um, and in fact every simulated model you have the ability to go deeper and, de <coughs> and deeper with nested complexity. Look under this mask and I can see the, the whole thing in all its glory as to how it's actually doing its gradient search. Uh, and there's a reference to that. Okay, so uh, this is a model you can run for yourself and, and see how it goes. I'm now going to run and try to make sense of a couple of different displays. We're going to listen to it and we're going to have a display which shows uh, the sine wave being killed, we hope. We're also going to find the, how the B and the A navigate themselves around in order to do this thing. Right, let's get rid of the, the migration of that to start with. Let's look at the yellow sine wave. This is always coming out. But when we go and change the frequency of this sine wave, for a certain while, both of these are producing the same output. Then, when the white one locks on and quenches down, we can see it happening down, we're seeing only the original sine wave left behind. So that's what's happening for the time that it takes to lock on and annihilate the sine wave. You can just see it beginning to annihilate it. Got it. How is it doing it? Well, it's, it's using that gradient algorithm which I mentioned a while ago. And here is the CPIG analyzer. And as we move this to some new frequency, we see this thing trundling off. Uh, we can see the pole in zero, the pole right, almost right on top of the zero, which is on the unit circle, and eventually locking on and killing the sine wave. Here it is tracking down. It seems to track a bit faster the closer it gets. It really homes in on there and gets it. This is an extremely cheap adaptive filter and very effective in many cases where you have narrowband interference.